Hi, internet strangers. <laughs> so I just saw I Am A Killer released on Netflix and I have a lot of thoughts. The first of which being, um, I fucking hated it. <laughs> I'm gonna be honest, okay? When I first saw this docuseries, I had this really visual reaction of like, I hate this guy and I can't believe he was given a platform. But then I was like, maybe I should take a step back because the subject matter was something that affected me personally. Some, like, I'm by I have a girlfriend right now. And so homophobia and biphobia is not something that I'm like not accustomed to. So I was like, maybe because of my personal experiences, homophobia with biphobia, I have a heightened reaction to this. Maybe I'm just being irrational. But then I thought about it for a little bit and I was like, no. Yeah, no, this guy sucks. Like, not being irrational at all whatsoever. And the thing is, I just don't think he should have ever been given a platform. I'm really confused as to why he was. The way I can describe this man is dangerous, and I don't mean that in the way of like, oh, he's a killer, which of course he's dangerous because he's a killer. Yeah, obviously that's like doesn't need to be said, but I would argue that his narrative is really fucking dangerous and something that I really didn't expect to see in 2020 on a major streaming service. I was really, really surprised. I really was. I genuinely was. For those of you who don't know what this show is about, spoiler alert, but this docuseries basically follows this guy who was on Texas death row. And because of changes in Texan legislation, he actually went from death row to life in prison. And then he went into parole board and he actually managed to get free. So he's actually one of seven people ever who's ever accomplished this, which I think is insane that this is what like, this is what made him accomplish that. His defense worked well enough that he is one of seven people to ever get free off a of death row. That is an insane statistic. Anyway, so maybe I should back up and, and say, like, what, who he is, what he did. So we're, in, we're introduced to him in the beginning of the series. And I'm going to be honest, my first reaction to this guy was, like, he's full of shit. Like, <laughs> I don't know. Maybe it was, like... I have an implicit bias towards like people who are overly religious because they don't tend to treat gay people like the nicest, you know? And I'm not saying like religious people in general. I'm obviously not saying that. I'm saying like religious fundamentalists that like there's no room for nuance. Everything in the Bible is 100% true and 100% uh, what we should be living our life by all the like think girl defined, you know? Like that kind of Christianity, I think we can all agree is kind of fucked. You know? Ancestral yeehaw like Bible thumping, like, shove a gay guy into the locker kind of religious, you know? And that's the vibe that he gave me, like, and I just think that maybe that's why I thought that, like, at first I was like, oh, he's like, he's full of it, like, there's, there's no way, like, there's no way that this is true. But then I was like, you know what, I'm gonna give him a chance, and I'm gonna, like, let him tell his story, and then I'm gonna see at the end if my first impression was true and honestly i think that my first impression was too generous i think that this guy is first of all i think he's absolutely full of shit i don't think he's found god at all i think that that's something that he said to the parole board because he knew that in religious texas that's something that they wanted to hear my instinct my instinct is that he's putting on the front and maybe he doesn't even really realize like consciously that he's doing it what did he do he basically says in the beginning the story that we get is that he shot this guy eight times in the back and twice in the head, which is like, whoa, overkill, <laughs> you know, like, he didn't just shoot this guy once, he shot him eight times and twice in the head, like, that is not kind of indicative of someone that is very, very remorseful, in my opinion. In my opinion, after you shoot once, and you don't stop, and you keep going, you aren't sorry, you know what I mean, like, it was also a really cowardly way to kill someone, like, to shoot them in the back, and so, already, I was like, <laughs> Okay, that's kind of sketch. And then they revealed that the guy was gay. The guy that he killed was gay. And I was like, oh no, it's going to be a hate crime, isn't it? And oh, yes it was. <laughs> yes it was. So they showed this guy that was his friend that testified against him in court. And he essentially said that he showed absolutely no remorse after he did it. And that he said, yeah, he had killed the f -slur. And so it kind of like starts to get a shadow on this guy's story that it's like he is remorseful. Don't get me wrong, I do think that people can change. I just think that that, that murder is maybe not something that we should forgive someone for. <laughs> like, I don't know if that's like a super controversial opinion, but I do think that murder is one of those things that you took somebody's life. You know what I mean? Like, that's something that their family can never get back. That is something that is unforgivable. Um, and the fact that you showed no remorse after the act 
and you're trying to get sympathy from the audience, like, it just really rubbed me the wrong way. Even, like, the victim's family, too, like, absolutely did not mince their words when it came to talking about him. They said that he thought that he should be dead and not free, and honestly, like, I don't blame them. They were really, really angry, and it's like, yeah, it was a senseless murder. I get it, you know? And then at the end of the second episode, he drops this, like, fucking bombshell of a confession where he says that the robbery actually wasn't a robbery at all and it, the like robbery and him taking the four hundred dollars was to cover up his true intentions which was to kill the guy because he was blackmailing him into being in a homosexual relationship with him yeah i know but he, essentially he said that the guy hit on him and then after he rejected the guy the guy said well i'm gonna tell people that you did it anyway so you might as well do it and Dale, which is the protagonist in the story, is like, if you do that, I'll kill you, and, and he did. So if you're paying attention at home, not only did he switch his story 25 years after he confessed in order to appeal to the parole board, he also literally used the gay panic defense. For those of you who don't know what the gay panic defense is, it's essentially a tactic where a straight guy will claim that that a gay guy hitting on him inspired such a fit of rage that he had absolutely no control over killing him, which is obviously bullshit <laughs> and homophobic and awful. But I want to maybe go over the history of gay, gay people and how we've been portrayed in media and how we've been portrayed in the film industry because I don't think that anything exists in a vacuum and I think that this kind of accusation is very very specific and it's something that we've definitely seen before and it's something that tries to prey onto people's implicit biases of gay people and it's something that has decades and decades of history behind it. So the way that I've kind of divided this video is into four parts. Um, the first part I'm going to talk about the gay portrayal in movies and media and kind of the motifs that kind of led us to where we are now in terms of the gay panic defense. The second part is going to talk about the gay panic defense, the times where it's worked in court, the times where it hasn't worked in court, what the differences are. The third part is going to be me explaining why the gay defense is so harmful and toxic to the gay community. I think that some of what I'm going to say should be fairly obvious, you know, like I don't think that any reasonable person would agree that a straight man killing a gay man for hitting on him in a non-violent way is a reasonable reaction, but I digress. <laughs> and then the fourth part, I really just want to go back to Dale and all of the problems I had with him and all of the problems I have with Netflix for actually giving this guy a platform and why I think that it's this, this docuseries isn't just tone deaf, it's actually pretty dangerous. So yeah, it's get into it. So part one is going to be the gay portrayal in movies and media. So I want to kind of talk about how gay people have been portrayed in film and in media because I do think that media influences our bias, especially our unconscious ones. If we're, if we're bombarded with a certain narrative 24-7 and, and for a lot of people that's the only kind of introduction that you get into that community, the way that you portray that community is a very important thing. It's very, very important to get it right and historically they definitely have not. It's important to get it right because that's the only point of contact some people have for the gay community, right? So they're going to base their opinions on what they see in the movie and what they see in media if they've never met a gay person. And there is plenty of material in the past to reinforce this screwed up notion and harmful notion that gay men are predators to straight. So let's begin. So at the very, very beginning of the film industry, gay men weren't portrayed as being predators, but they were portrayed as being like sissies. The role of a sissy would basically be just to be comic relief. The person was a caricature of what a gay person was. So he was overly effeminate. He was <laughs> play up negative stereotypes associated with gay men in order to get kind of this cheap laugh from the audience because like homophobia and sexism is hilarious, right? It's kind of like when white people used to do the blackface shows and put on this like caricature of what they imagine a black person to be based on negative stereotypes. Obviously not the same thing, but same kind of concept. And then during the Great Depression, obviously people weren't spending as much money going to the movies and so the movie companies had to think of a way to make their movies so outrageous and so shocking that people would want to go see it. And a lot of the times this would include having a gay character or a character that did queer things explicitly. In response to this, actually, the US Supreme Court ruled that movie industry actually isn't protected under the First Amendment right 
and so the Hayes Code was born. It's also known as the Measure Motion Picture Production Code, which it was basically a list of things that you couldn't portray in the movies. Um, and one of them was sexual deviancy, and homosexuality at that time fell under uh, sexual deviancy. So this guy named Joe Breen, to be confused with Neil Breen, our Lord and Savior. <laughs> basically would look over the scripts to the movies and see what was acceptable and if it wasn't acceptable then he would censor it. A about a sexually confused alcoholic became a movie about an alcoholic writer. Crossfire was actually supposed to be about gay bashing and murder but it was turned into anti-semitism and murder. And so this kind of forced movie creators to be a lot more subtle if they were going to include a queer character and so this is when the birth of queer coding was born. Examples of queer coding would be the Maltese Falcon, where in the original novel it's very very clear and says outright that the guy is a homosexual, but because of the censorship that movies were going through, the movie makes this homosexuality intentionally very vague. Another example is Ben-Hur, which the writer verbatim, I will never use the word, it's not going to be overt, but it will be perfectly clear that Masala is in love with Ben-Hu. They're both men in this instance. At the same time, in 1949, a former LA cop, which like of course he's a fucking cop, <laughs> wrote this like insensationalized expose on like so-called sexual deviance, where he equated homosexuality with masochism, bestiality, and murderous impulses. This kind of triggered this trend of major newspapers and major publications publishing these publications that basically were painting queer people out to be pervert exhibitionalist, dangerous sadists, who, who hurt people, who who were targeting your kids, who wanted to rape your kids, and who wanted to turn them gay. The expose actually led to like kind of a trend. So in the 1940s there was only really two such stories in the top selling newspapers that painted gay people as predators, but in the 1950s there were about 21 of them, including one in time called The Abnormals, where this where gay people were described as degenerate and just plain disgusting and we were portrayed as either criminally insane or just insane and then same thing in the 1960s about the same amount of publications so so mainstream media was kind of starting to push this narrative that gay men were dangerous and gay men were predators and then in 1952 the joseph burstein inc v wilson extended the first amendment legal protection to the movie industry. They basically reversed the decision that they made in the beginning. The censorship code was essentially destroyed. And at this point, Americans were kind of shifting away from the Catholic Church being their absolution, right? The movies really didn't really need the church's approval in order to do well, because the, the, the threat of a boycott just didn't have the same effect now that the Catholic Church wasn't as influential as it might have been a couple of decades ago. But at the same time, and I think that this can probably also be attributed to those exposés, those sensationalized exposés that I talked to beforehand, there was this real big shift in the portrayal of gay characters. Instead of being gay-coded, now they are more explicitly gay, but they were either punished at the end for being gay, where they, they either died or committed suicide. They kind of treated them as these miserable, suicidal misfits that were suffering because of their sexuality. It was not a positive portrayal of homosexuality in the slightest. In the children's hour, one of the female characters kills herself at the end because she's experiencing homosexual desires towards Audrey Hepburn's character, which like, <laughs> same girl. <laughs> it was either they killed themselves because they were miserable about their sexuality, or they killed other people because they were miserable about just their sexuality. So this new representation of gay people was really detrimental to the gay community because it painted these gay people as these unhinged monsters that really couldn't help but kill people. And some examples of this kind of trope would be Strangers on the Train, where Robert Walker is a psychotic a gay character that convinces another character to swap murders. Alfred Hitchcock's Psycho is a cross-dresser, which at the same time was very, very linked to the gay community. There's also some transphobia there, which is fun. And then Basic Instinct had Sharon Stone playing a bisexual serial killer, so <laughs> there really isn't a limited supply of these kinds of movies. Like, there are so many out there. America in the 80s had withstood a lot of 
civil rights movements. There was obviously the civil rights movements which started back in the 50s, and then there was Stonewall that started in 69, so the gay pride movement. There was the feminist movement that was focusing more on second wave feminism, which was less so on voting rights and more so on social rights. So like the right to control, the right to not be sexually harassed at work, that kind of thing. And so there, in this span of like 30 years, there was this very big and noticeable shift in American culture. And some people really just couldn't keep up. <laughs> <laughs> we're like, this is wrong. And so there was an organized religious political movement that arose in America in order to counter these kinds of progressive ideals. And they actually had a lot of political clout. They really influenced the Republican Party to move further and further to the political right. And because of this, the threat of being boycotted because of a char gay character became all the more real as well. Again, they couldn't make any sort of sympathetic gay character or else they he would go out of business, you know? So if there was a gay character, he either was there to be laughed at, pitied, or feared. The 80s is also the time where the AIDS epidemic was in full swing, and that made people hate and fear the LGBTQ community even more. Philadelphia was one of the first films to actually depict the main gay character as somebody who was sympathetic. And Tom Hanks specifically said that he was chosen because he was a non-threatening actor, and they needed a non-threatening actor today, so a guy, a gay guy in America with AIDS, so that the audience could sympathize a bit more with him. Of course, he still dies at the end, which still kind of like links subliminally homosexuality and death together, but at least during the movie, he wasn't portrayed, you know, as insane or anything. He was portrayed as, as a human. And I think that that it started the shift towards more kind of accepting media. But the thing is, we have literal decades of the, these queer coded movies that associated queer people with being murderers, with being predators, with being killers, with being so unhappy with their own sexuality that they either hurt themselves or they hurt others. And that's not something that you can just undo, you know? Especially for people that grew up with that kind of messaging, you internalize that. You kind of be naive to think that literal decades of this kind of messaging didn't influence criminal courts cases or anything in the real world. Which brings me to part two of this video, which is gay panic defense. So the gay panic defense actually has its roots in theories by Dr. Edward Kempf. Edward Kempf basically observed in the 20s what he coined as homosexual panic, which was essentially people that self-identified as heterosexual but struggled with same-sex attraction, and then a person with homosexual panic would try to hook up with a hetero person, and then when they weren't successful, they would spiral into suicidal ideation, depression, and anxiety, and that kind of thing. And the DSMD actually listed homosexual panic disorder in its 1952 edition, but then the term hasn't really appeared in the manual since. It was kind of as controversial back then, even then. Essentially, Dr. Edward Kempf coined internalized homophobia, but he called it homosexual panic. It's like gay panic as an excuse to hurt people was really problematic for really two reasons. And coining this as a mental illness implied that internalized homophobia came from a place of mental illness where it doesn't. Studies show that it comes from a place of sexual conservatism and also prejudice, just bigotry. And then the second reason is that Kemp's patients never actually hurt anybody else. They only ever hurt themselves. And people were trying to say that because of internalized homophobia, they would be driven to hurt other people, which is not what his study showed at all. Another flaw with this was that he studied both men and women, and both men and women had the same kind of reactions, and, and the gay panic defense is almost exclusively used in male trials. So why wouldn't it affect girls the same way that it affects guys if it's an innate mental illness, you know what I mean? Like, it's clearly not. All this kind of implies that it's not innate, and it's more linked to a type of mas a very specific type of masculinity, a very toxic type of masculinity, but I digress. <laughs> there are essentially two types of defenses in the criminal justice system. One of them is called excuse and the other one is called justification. An excuse is when the action that they did was morally wrong, but the person cannot be held accountable for doing that action. So one example of this would be not guilty by reason of insanity. And the justification is when the action itself wasn't wrong given the circumstances. So self-defense. Basically. And gay panic is interesting because it doesn't really fit into one or the other. It usually piggybacks off of another defense, like either an insanity plea or a provocation plea or a self-defense plea. 
usually actually when it's used to piggyback off of an insanity plea, it isn't successful. So in 1967, male defendants began to use a panic in order to try to claim a verdict that was like not guilty by, by reason of insanity. So heterosexual men essentially claimed that a homosexual advance caused a violent psychotic reaction that caused them to lose control over their own mental abilities and basically murder this guy. Um, there are a couple things wrong. The first of which is that gay panic is not a mental disorder. <laughs> So if you're trying to claim insanity and the reason that you think you should be entitled to insanity isn't even classified as a mental illness, like... The second is that in order to use an insanity defense, you have to make the case that you actually didn't know at the time of committing the murder that what you were doing was wrong. But most claims of the insanity-based gay panic defense actually haven't been successful, which is great. <laughs> One example of this is pe People versus Pharisees. The defendant was essentially walking down the road when the guy he had met in the car at the dealership pulled up next to him and said, hey, you want a ride? And then he got in and then the guy drove to a secluded area and tried to make him perform sexually in his favor. And if not, then he told him that he had to walk. And so the guy beat him to death. And at the trial, his lawyer actually tried to claim that he was a latent homosexual with an inferiority complex, which, which must have like grinded this guy's gears. Um, and it didn't even work, he was found guilty. <laughs> so like, yikes. It does work sometimes though. Diminished capacity was actually used when Jonathan Schmidt killed his gay friend Scott Amadir after an appearance on the Jenny Jones show. There's a really good episode on this but of Trial by Media on Netflix about this particular case if you want to check out more information but essentially his gay friend got him on the show and then admitted that he had a crush on him like on the show publicly and then he was so embarrassed by that that he murdered him a couple of days later. The lawyers claimed that he was so embarrassed and infuriated by being publicly humiliated because his gay friend said that he had a crush on him that he had diminished capacity and it actually worked. The jury bumped him down from first degree murder to second degree murder. It is harder to use the gay panic defense as a defense for an insanity plea though. And some of that has to do with the fact that some of the states in the US straight up don't recognize temporary insanity as a viable defense. Most cases involving gay panic actually use it as a provocation defense, and a provocation defense essentially states that a defendant charged with murder can be convicted of a lesser offense of voluntary manslaughter if the jury finds that the defendant was actually unreasonably provoked into heat of passion. So this worked in a 1991 trial. There was this guy named Stephen Stick that got in at Lammy's car and asked where he could get a blowjob where the other man allegedly responded with, I could do that, and drove him to a high school where he proceeded to take off his pants and try to grab at the other guy. Stick beat the living shit out of him until he died. And then the defense claimed that Lammy's unwanted sexual advances provoked him into a heat of the passion and so the jury should bump him down to involuntary manslaughter. There was a couple of things that probably contributed to the fact that the jury actually did rule in his favor in this one. Lamy was a guy that was almost twice this Stitt's age, which may have tapped into that like implicit bias of like older gay man trying to be predatory to a younger straight guy that we've been coded for decades. Also his lawyer argued that his actions were necessary in order to prevent a sexual assault, which was kind of bullshit because he used he didn't use violence to escape the sexual assault he beat this guy to death you know what i mean like that's overkill that's not that's not self-defense at that point if he had been a girl i feel like a jury would have been more wary of this response and another thing that like undermines this whole like oh he was in the heat of passion thing was that he stole his watch his cigarettes and he wiped his fingerprints out from a out from his car and it's like if you have enough peace of mind to do that and to steal and to kind of try to get rid of the evidence then were you really in this uncontrollable fit of rage where you couldn't control your actions you know like it just didn't really like doesn't really add up that's the thing too is one pattern that emerges from these gay panic cases often is is that three why is the gay panic defense so harmful as I said, some of this should be obvious, but like, I'm gonna present them anyway. But um, 
like as I've been saying, it kind of reinforces these really harmful stereotypes that I mentioned that gay guys are predators towards straight guys. It's like in this society, men are supposed to be interested in women and not men. And they're typically the sexual aggressors, they're not the ones being aggressed upon. And so a gay man approaching a straight man violates both of those conditions. And so the fact that a heterosexual man's feelings of fear and loathing are validated in this case kind of indicates a really flawed society in my personal opinion. I don't think that that's justified at all whatsoever. It also sends the message that heterosexual men are innately better than homosexual men because responding with violence when approached with a non-violent way in order to prove that they're not gay, that logic only works if we think that homosexuality is somehow inferior to heterosexuality, right? I mean, there's a bias there. It also privileges heterosexual men over gay men in another way. If a heterosexual man responds violently to a homosexual advance, sometimes he's seen as, as that, that reaction is seen as being reasonable. Whereas if a gay man ever responded to a girl hitting on him in the same way, no way would that be justified in any way. So it holds this like heterosexual male violence over any type of, of violence, really. It also privileges it over another type of violence, which is female violence. Like, how many girls do you know that has been either sexually assaulted, groped in a public place? Can you imagine if every girl that's been groped in a public club just kills the guy? Like, we'd have no more men, you know what I mean? <laughs> like, we'd, like, it'd be cut in half. How many times have I been groped in a club? Like, more than I can count. It's disgusting, but it happens all the time. But our violence isn't justified after being harassed because we're expected to kind of put up with it. Whereas male violence is arguably the same thing in the situation. There's, there's an unwanted male sexual advance, but heterosexual men are allowed to respond with violence, whereas heterosexual women are never allowed this kind of same leniency. So this is just kind of going to play into the part of part four, which is the problem that I have with I Am A Killer released. So now that we've established kind of the history of gay people in the media and the gay panic defense, I'm going to go back to the original point of this video, which is uh, the show should have absolutely never fucking happened. And it's wild to me that he even got a platform to begin with. It perpetuate this age-old claim of the homosexual predator and it's extra disgusting because he changed his story to get his parole granted he probably knew that in texas that was going to make him more favorable to the parole board and it's even more disgusting and cowardly because the guy that he killed isn't here to defend himself like he is literally blaming the victim of his murder for get for murdering him like that is Sir. And the guy literally claims in the series that he's not homophobic. He verbatim says that he doesn't think himself as though homophobic, that he just thinks that the lifestyle is sinful, which is homophobic, by the way. That's that's a homophobic thing to say. You are homophobic, my dude. Um, and the prosecutor and the lead detective do say like that this isn't a reason to murder someone, but they, nobody points out in this documentary how blatantly homophobic this is and how blatantly problematic this narrative that he's trying to push is. Like nobody addresses that he is literally playing the gay panic card. How? Like, without a clear indication of, hey, this was wrong on so many levels. There's a historical context to why this is wrong. There is so many reasons. Seeing this behavior as normal and acceptable is not productive in a, in, a, in a progressive society. There's so many reasons, and yet nobody mentions any of it during the documentary. Like, at one point, the woman who he's staying in his house for house arrest, that's not full, but you know what I mean. His son says that he would have done the same thing. That's insane. That's literally insane. The fact that they literally were like, yeah, I would have done the same thing, and they kept that in documentary is concerning to me, because that is somebody saying that you are gay should not be a reason to kill someone, and trying to even imply that it is a reasonable reason to kill someone is, is so wrong. <laughs> like, so wrong. And I don't, the th my, like, the biggest problem, I think, like, the biggest problem I have with this documentary is that it tries, and I don't know if this was intentional or not, I don't know, like, what the filmmaker was really trying to get at, I don't know what story he was trying to tell here. To me as an audience, like, as an audience member viewing this, it really, really felt like he was trying to make himself the victim, and he was trying to, he was trying to paint this guy as a victim who just had, did what he had to do. No, he's not a victim. He's not somebody that we should be idolizing. He's not somebody that we should be painting in a, in a positive way whatsoever. He's, he is somebody who committed 
murder because of homophobia. That's not something that should be minimized. That's not something that you should be okay with in any way, shape, or form. And I feel like maybe this wasn't intentional. Maybe they didn't intend for it to be like, oh yeah, like, he, like he has a point and he, sh like he, people should sympathize with him. Maybe that's not their point. Maybe that's not what they intended to happen. But that's what it came off as, and that is so dangerous because people watching this Netflix documentary that have the same thought process as he does can get validated in that thought process, and that is scary. That is so scary. Gay people die from this, from this kind of thinking, and having this line of thinking on a major, major streaming platform being promoted is mind-boggling to me. I don't understand how that got greenlit. Like, I really don't. Also, showing that this guy got to walk free after a literal death row conviction because he used the gay, gay to panic defense sends the message that by using the gay panic defense, you can convince, you can convince the parole board to get you to prison and kind of sends this message that people will be sympathetic towards you if you commit an act of violence out of homophobia. I got really mad there. I mean, like, I feel like I have the right to be mad. All in all, justifying any violence is really questionable, but justifying homophobic violence is reckless and dangerous, and this docu-series is absolute trash and it should never have existed. Um, thanks for coming to my TED talk. <laughs> like, subscribe. Uh, this is my first video, so it would actually really help me out if you guys could subscribe and we could, you know, be friends. And you could chill with me. Um, it's really fun. It's really fresh. We don't murder people because we're homophobic here. So if that's something that you're into, <laughs> I'm gonna stop. Alright, bye. <laughs> See you next time.